Okay, welcome everyone. So we're gonna get started. Sorry for the little delay. Um, before we begin, I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayakono, the Cayuga Nation. The Gayakono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Gayakono's dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Gayakono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. So welcome everyone. My name is Nikita Sukmono, one of this year's SEEP grad student co-chairs. Um, we'd like to extend our thanks to you all for joining us today, whether in person uh, or virtually. And uh, what a beautiful day, I think, to welcome our honored guest, Professor Kong, today um, as we continue on in our spring semester. Um, for all of those joining us for the first time, uh, the Ronald and Jeanette Gaddy Lecture Series is a weekly lecture series held every Thursday at this time during the academic year at the George McTee Kane Center. Uh, for advanced research on Southeast Asia, eliciting engaged conversations between scholars across uh, all disciplines in Southeast Asian studies. Um, we are so happy to enjoy the delicious return of Gaddy tradition with a catered lunch being served alongside the talk today uh, from New Delhi Diamonds in Ithaca. Um, but anyway, now with that out of the way, I'll pass it off to my fellow co-chair to introduce our illustrious guests who made the journey all the way from sunny California to decidedly less sunny Ithaca. <laughs> All right, so greetings. Uh, my name is Elisa Domingo Badike. I go by E. Um, I am one of I am the other C grad student co-chair. And um, we would like to extend our thanks to you all for joining us today, whether in person or virtually. And what a beautiful it is, uh, day it is to welcome our honored guest, Professor Kong. And um, Let's see, um, this is our, um, so we're gonna give you a little intro. Uh, so Dredge um, Kong, uh, PhD, MPH, is an assistant professor of anthropology at the University of California, San Diego. His research focuses on beauty and love as they intersect with race, class, gender, sexuality, transnationality, and structural violence in interracial, interracial relationships, body modification, popular culture, um, and an HIV. Dredge's first book, White Asian Aspirations, Queer R Racialization in Thailand, argues that recent Asian regionalism has helped construct a new, quote, Asian racial category in Asia modeled on the naturalized alignment of light skin color and national achievement. Dredge's second project, The Total Package, examines the Korean wave in Thailand. So if we could all give a warm round of applause for Professor Kang. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh. <laughs> uh, so I have a pre intro and then I'll start. <laughs> if I can get this to move, it's. Oh, sorry. Uh, so, as many of you know, this is Tiny Year, so Sawati be my. Um, and one of my rituals every morning is that I go through my Facebook memories. And so I was remembering that uh, this time a few, like while I was doing field work, um, was during the red shirt protests. And so like there was a national state of emergency, but everyone was partying in the streets anyway, because it was Tiny Year, and this is um, a few years ago. Um, if you don't know, the Siloam area of Bangkok has this ginormous like queer, New Year party, which is an image from. Happy New Year. Um, and today on my memory feed in 2016, I got my job at UCSD, so that was noted. Um, and also last year, uh, I was having lots of problems, these wires coming from my head, um, because I was having brain monitoring at that time. Uh, so I just wanted to let you know. Um, I have pills here, <laughs> so uh, if if you hear me doing things like slurring speech or saying things that don't make sense anymore, or if I start twitching, uh, just say, Dredge, do you need to take a break? Take a pill, um, and we'll go from there. <coughs> Someone mentioned that I'm coming from sunny California. 
Unfortunately, our weather is so good that we can't deal with weather. So Tuesday we had wind and wind meant that my power went out all day at the house. Um, so I couldn't revise like stuff at home on Tuesday. Uh, and so I did my revisions on the plane as many people do when they're traveling to these kinds of things. Of course, everything I do is in the cloud. And so when I did my revisions on the plane, um, there is no cloud in the plane. Well, you're in the clouds, but there's no cloud because there's no Wi-Fi. Um, so my changes did not save. So my text and my slides are no longer synced. Um, so what I'm going to do is read very little of the written text that I have and just talk through most of my slides. Um, and I've crossed out here perfectionist tendencies. So, you know, just remember that, cross it out. And especially for grad students, you should really learn to improvise. Um, one of the saddest things that I see at conferences is when people are reading and they get like the five minute warning and they continue to read for another 15 minutes because they don't know how to like sum up what they're trying to say. So, you know, work on that as a skill. Um, also something, uh, this is something that's new where I'm, you know, talking to students about things. Uh, so one of the things I have is aphantasia, which means that I can't make mental images in my head. Uh, so part of my process for writing is that I don't do outlines, which is like, you know, how they tell you to start a paper and stuff like that. So what I do is actually create a slideshow with images. And based on the images, I create a narrative. And then I use that narrative to start writing text. And then I go back and forth, tack back and forth between my slides and my narrative. So that's the process that I use for writing. Um, and a little tip, you know, have a writing partner for accountability. Um, I know Arnica had my partner as uh, her writing partner, uh, and that also gives you a lot of feedback. So that's very useful. <clears throat> so that was my pre. <laughs> so now I'm actually going to start. Um, as and as I mentioned, my text is no longer synced, so I'm going to talk through the slides mostly. Uh, so I want to thank. Uh, the Gandhi Lecture Series and Cornell University for inviting me. Um, Tamara, I know she's on the Zoom, uh, met with me in Bangkok when I was a grad student and I'm very appreciative for um, professors who take out the time to meet with grad students and things like that. Uh, Arnica is here in the audience. And last night, Juno and Noah picked me up from the airport and we went to dinner. So I want to thank them too. I know they're also teaching at one. Um, <clears throat> so this is, uh, kind of what I'm using for the talk today. Uh, so I published a paper last year in Asian Studies Review, which is kind of the basis for this. Uh, and one of the benefits of bringing someone as opposed to you know, reading a paper is that you have different kinds of interactions. And for me, I, if I'm doing a talk, it's never gonna be a paper that I read because you, know, you paid me to fly out here and so you deserve better than that. Uh, and you can always <laughs> read the paper if you want. It's you know, obviously available. Um, and I'm going to incorporate um, pieces of two book projects. So uh, White Asian Aspirations, Fair Racialization in Thailand. Um, I have everything but the conclusion done. So that's coming out soon, hopefully. Um, and the second book is the total package, the Korean wave and transformations of gender and sexuality in Thailand. So I'll incorporate parts of that into my talk today. I'm gonna skip these things um, just because I no longer have a line text, so I'm just gonna move in a different way. Uh, so this is the outline of my argument today. Um, and I kind of have it broken in different parts now because I was rearranging on the plane. Uh, so the first and the third part is that um, these practices of beauty are increasingly linked to what I'm referring to as white Asians, and I'll explain that. And the middle part, which is the part that is in the uh, article I just mentioned uh, is that Thai bodily aesthetics are key to what I call being rip roy, uh, neat, orderly, or complete. Um, and that rather than being merely cosmetic, these practices about transformation address broader moral concerns about face and the appropriate expression of social status in Thailand. So I started um, the, the, the book starts with an interview uh, that I did with an uh, informant in, in Thailand. Um, and during the interview, he points at me and he says, um, 
like this, not like this. <laughs> but he points at me and says, you're white, like me, right? And so that kind of like threw me off. Um, and that's when I started thinking about uh, this idea of what I'm calling the white Asian. And then he goes on about how, you know, mainland Chinese, they don't have manners, unlike Chinese in Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan. And, and the person that I'm interviewing is a Sino Thai in, in Bangkok. Um, Chinese from the mainland black class. So he was making these kinds of differentiations about different kinds of Chinese. And in particular, this is the period when uh, mainland Chinese tourists become the majority of tourists in, in Bangkok. Okay. Uh, so I'm using this term um, white Asian, which is not a Thai term, but my kind of uh, etic or analytic term. And I'm using it by taking two different Thai terms and combining it. So the term that um, in, in that interview he used to refer to me was kon kao, which means white person. Um, and then the other term that comes up a lot in my research is kon asia, which means Asian person. Um, and the term kon asia is actually relatively recent because Thais have never used a racial term for Asians before. Uh, so Juliana and Teen, um, uh, her work, she basically places it in the early 2000s, the kind of use of the term kon asia. And Kuan Kao is even more recent in the 2010s. Um, so when I did that interview that I cite, um, that was a month before the Oishi controversy, which I'll talk about. So the term is precedes the Oishi controversy, but the Oishi controversy kind of explodes the term, makes it much um, more popular, makes it more known in uh, public discourse. <clears throat> and the way that I'm using white Asia is to refer to both skin color and kind of national economic development. So when Thais are using the term Quin Asia, there are certain Asians that count as Quin Asia and certain ones that don't, like Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar are not Asian. Um, and I'll talk about that in a, in a bit. Um, and uh, I'm also looking at kind of indigenous kind of ways of naming things. So Thais don't use the term yellow to refer to skin color. Um, they usually refer to people as being black or white, you know, your cow or your dom, so that's, which is common in much of Asia, uh, including, for example, the Chinese and the Japanese culture, right? So Chinese refer to themselves as white, Japanese refer to themselves as white, and then barbarians are the dark-skinned people, like Okinawans or Hmong or et cetera. Uh, so part of what I'm looking at is kind of um, taking away this assumption that whiteness is something that's a unique property of Caucasianness and that whiteness has kind of a broader kind of uh, implication in the world. Um, it's still Im implicated in anti-blackness across the world, but it's not something that's unique to Caucasianness. And part of what I'm trying to work through with white Asian aspirations is looking at how these new ideas of racialized whiteness uh, tied to Asian bodies also perpetuate anti-blackness and other forms of uh, discrimination. Sure. Okay. Another term that I use sometimes is Corpanese, which basically is just taking Korean and Japanese and combining them. Um, and I do this because, so there's two terms I use in the book that are kind of not normal. So Corpanese and Tropical Chinese. And Tropical Chinese I use because as you saw in that first quote, there's this strong distinction between mainland Chinese and the other Chinese, right? From Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, et cetera. So I use Tropical Chinese to refer to that group because that's what when I was talking with Thai people, they made that distinction very clearly. Like mainland Chinese are different from these other Chinese. Um, and I use Corpanese because Thai people like Americans and other folks uh, kind of confuse Korea and Japan in a lot of ways. Um, so they would often mix things up uh, or look at something like anime and say that's Korean. Uh, if you go to Japanese festivals in Bangkok, they play K-pop as opposed to J-pop at the festival. Um, so it's this kind of mixing of Japan and Korea. Um, and those two countries kind of are the idealized countries for the white Asians that I'm talking about. So that's the term that I use. And one of the ways that my thinking has changed kind of in the process of working on this project um, is that, um, you know, I went to school in the uh, early 2000s, my graduate training. And in the 90s were like the, the decade of resistance, right? Everything was about resistance. Um, so that's kind of where I started, but where I ended up is kind of looking at the idea of complicity more. 
So it's not about necessarily resistance, for example, of Thai people to the West, but complicity with other kinds of status hierarchies that are pre-existing in the world, for example, white privilege. So that's kind of how I've been changing my thinking around this. <clears throat> I'm gonna skip this for time. Um, so one of the things that I started with when I started doing my research in Thailand was I actually started, um, my initial project was around HIV and sex work. And then I've moved very far from that, but um, sex work still grounds a lot of my research in Thailand. And part of the way that it grounds my research now is that I work, my project ended up being mostly about middle-class people and how they distance themselves from sex work, right? In, in Thailand, because Thailand has a reputation for quote unquote being the brothel to the world, right? So these are images from Michael Swanasai. These were censored in Thailand. Um, they're images of, it's not actually semen, but they're called come on the face, uh, you know, and one of the things that Thailand is obviously known for is uh, particularly Katai male to female um, individuals and kind of gender transformations and surgery like Aren Thoreau's book on, um, uh, you know, um, gender confirmation surgery in Thailand. And this is an image from um, Facebook where you see the person's in 12th grade on the upper left and by the time they're in third year of college, the person's like totally transformed, right? Um, and the way people talk about gender is very different than American people. And one of the things is that there's no kind of dead naming. There's no like uh, shaming about prior gender identities. It's kind of like, it's not a secret, right? It's not something to be ashamed about. It's just kind of like, yep, this is my accomplishment. This is how great I look now compared to, you know, what I was before. Um, and um, these are images from people getting ready for a trans beauty pageant. Um, and I talk about spectacular femininity, a Choa's term, but I'm not going to go into that now. What I want to focus on here um, is if you, so are this person, if you think their arms are a different color than their chest. And in this image, you can see the arms are a different color than the legs. So part of the beauty contest pageant transformation for this individual was not just going from a male form to a female form, but also lightening the skin, right? So they, they take uh, the lightest foundation they get and they add a little red blush. And I'll talk about, you know, white with a touch of pink in, it, in a bit. And they mix that and they put it all over their arms so that, and their face and their neck so that when you see them, they actually look whiter on stage than they actually really are. Uh, so that's kind of the thing you see there. And obviously there are different kinds of changes like hair length is really important in Thailand. Um, so growing your hair out, stuff like that. And um, this is an image from a TV show I was watching when I was doing my field work in the, it's a variety show. And the, the host has to figure out which of these women wasn't born a woman, right? Um, so that's like, he's here, he's like sniffing their, handkerchiefs and stuff to see how they smell. Smells really big in Thailand, obviously. Um, and there's a term kind of were. So, um, you know, trans women are often said to be more beautiful than uh, quote unquote uh, real women. And um, this is another artist whose work um, I participated in and, you know, I followed during my field work. Uh, he's an artist from Isan and he had this um, project called The Dream of Beyond where he becomes blonde and uh, water buffaloes. So he goes from like dark water buffaloes to albino water buffaloes. So there's this kind of lightning and process, which is part of my kind of white Asianness. So I just wanted to show you a brief clip from this film, which you can't see because can I move this? I think there's actually a way to get rid of it. I can't see. Oh, hi. Okay, right there. Okay, great. Pichai is a fan of Pichai. He has been here since the time of Pichai. Pichai is more than that. More than that. ขาวกว่าเขามีทุกอย่าง
ที่เพกไม่มีอืม so the brother actually works at a host bar which is this image here and then the boyfriend of the brother is the taller richer whiter one which is like all this um all the beauty standards for you know kind of wealth in, in Thailand uh, so in terms of skin lightening there are a lot of different kinds of things that you can use laser treatments uh, glutathione which is the only thing that I know that actually works uh, it inhibits the production of melanin in your skin so it actually does make you physically lighter um, I don't know if that's what Michael Jackson used but it does like literally make your body white and I talk about um, one case of that in, in the article um, obviously this is this is dodo not dove so this is kind of an ironic you know um, art piece kind of commenting on the skin lightening products and if you go into a Thai store and you look for something like um, soap it's hard to find anything that doesn't say lightning already on it um, last night when I got into a hotel I put on my little cream mask and I this morning when I looked at it I said oh it says whitening Right. Because you just can't find products that don't say whitening already on them. Um, and you know, this is not just a Thai thing. I have this image from the Philippines. You know, feel whiter and gayer every day. Um, and this is an image from a uh, Korean cosmetics ad in New York City, which was taken down because in the U.S., you know, being white is not considered a good thing, right? Or desiring to be white is not considered a good thing. Um, so the kind of ideas around whiteness are obviously different. <clears throat> so this was the ad campaign that I was talking about, which is the Oishi Amino Plus. So Oishi is a Thai brand. Oishi obviously means delicious in Japanese. It's a Thai brand of Japanese food. Um, and they have these beverages that come in. Uh, and a whole line of, um, in Thailand, you can buy a beverage that does everything for you, make you smarter, make you whiter, make you... <laughs> And this one specifically makes it <clears throat> whiter, right? And the ideal color that they are promoting is um, Pew Cow Om Chom Pu. So Om means like, like if you are my age and remember those Tootsie Roll pop commercials, like the little owl, right? That's, that's the Om, right? So it's kind of like how you suck on a hard candy or something. And that's the ideal color that they are um, promoting in this ad. And this does have glutathione in it. But this is eaten, so it doesn't work. <laughs> if you inject glutathione into your blood, it works. If you ingest it, it does not work. So no need to buy this product. <laughs> um, and so this was the controversial ad. So th this is the BTS, obviously. And um, this, they put these signs up on top of the seats, and it says seats reserved for white people, Kun Kano. Right? So, after three days, they were taken down because there was um, a lot of media backlash around this campaign. So you can see that the ad is here. They wrapped the entire train in this ad. Um, all the, like if you're in the New York subway, you see the same thing, right? All the ads are coordinated throughout the entire train. Um, and then the train station that was closest to where I live, the entire train station was done in this, in this ad. <clears throat> Um, and this is another paper that I hope to get out soon. But um, uh, so this is another controversial ad for Soul Secret Snows. And so you see like the light version and the dark version of this person. Um, and so this is an image from CNN. And a lot of you know Western media outlets wrote about this ad and how Thai ads are so racist and colorist and things like that. Um, but none of them mentioned the fact that this is Soul Secret, not. Swiss secret or Scandinavian secret, right? So the, they often write about these ads and how sad it is that Thai people want to be Caucasian, but they're missing for me the point that the kind of model for whiteness is not necessarily Caucasian whiteness, but in this case, it's Korean whiteness. This is an image from Korea itself. This is an Instadong, which is the kind of touristy, artsy, crafty uh, part of Seoul. Um, and this is obviously, advertising to ties because the sign is in Thai and says, you know, buy it here because it's three times more expensive in Thailand. Because the Korean cosmetics have luxury tax in Thailand, which is 300%. <clears throat> this is an ad. So this is from um, the Victory Monument area, this is the Century Mall, which burned down during the 2010 
um, uh, consecration and then was rebuilt. And they rebuilt it exactly how it was before, which is the diversity, <laughs> <laughs> including like the, the wrong steps and <laughs> things like that. Uh, but this is a, an ad from, uh, you know, one of the stalls, it's Make Me White. But you'll notice that the text is in Japanese and Japanese basically says it's sunscreen. Um, <laughs> So again, there are these references to whiteness that aren't necessarily about uh, Caucasian. In the back, you see a Nature Republic, but it's actually a fake Nature Republic. Nature Republic is a Korean brand. This is a fake one. Um, and this is from 2016. So there was a citywide campaign for this new product called Snail White, uh, which is based on, so I was looking at my little, these are the things that you get for free when you buy something at like a Korean cosmetic store. So I was noticing that what I use today is, you know, serum descargo and creme descargo, right? So these are snail, but in French, <laughs> right? So again, obviously this is a specific reference to Korean cosmetics, not to that or something else. <clears throat> I just put this away because I'm not reading it all. Um, and this is an image from, like adjectives in English and at the bottom there's a handsome and an ugly. And the handsome is like this hip hop boy band member image. And then the ugly is like a black rapper image, right? So they're kind of ingrained um, ideas. <clears throat> this is an example of how the term Kwon Kao can be used. So this is a profile from, from Jack uh, where the um, person's referring to themselves as Kwon Kao a white person, um, and specifically as D, which is kind of um, the word for being sino thai male. All right, I'm gonna skip this. That's what I look like. In a, this is <laughs> as a woman in a uh, beauty pageant, because one of my best friends said, you can't do your project unless you enter at least one beauty contest. And then on the left, you see kind of what I would look like kind of Burmese style with the Tanaka on the face. And on the right, this is like, you know, me Korean style, so to speak. So these are kind of different opposite poles of what's considered desirable in kind of the contemporary back proxy, right? Because Burmese are not those Asians. Um, and so this is part of my second project. And I just wanted to show you some images from it. Um, so, I use the word sissy a lot, which offends some people, but doesn't offend me. Very common in Thai and Chinese and other kinds of languages to use the term. Um, the Thai term is tut, and this is a hashtag, you know, I know you're a tut. Uh, and you can see that the range of what a tut is is very wide. Um, so you can be kind of normatively masculine, but be gay and be a tut, and you can be like trans. This was one of my neighbors, um, Lily, when I lived in the Thai Thai area. Um, so it's a very wide range, right? It doesn't mean like one specific thing. And this is a stick figure for a tom, and you know that the person's tom because of a little indentation here, which means that they're binding their breasts, right? So that's the how the stick figure represents the tom. <clears throat> and these are um, emic drawings. So this is from Thailand, and it's a, you know human, and then on the on the left side is male, on the right side is female. So these are the people who would be considered dut, or I call it katalinus, kind of more broadly. Um, and you can, you know, be normative and masculine or be a trans woman, and you could still fit in this in this category. On this image, this is the top. So keep that in mind. And one of the things I was looking at for my second project, I did this at the same time, but writing them as you know separate things, uh, was kind of how. Korean beauty ideals became normalized. Um, so this is the group of you know, young men I would call sissies who are um, who are doing the same <laughs> look. So you, so they basically look the same as you can see. And you can see, for example, that person's hairstyle is from this ad for Korean cosmetics. So the the kind of mimicry is really detailed and precise. And one of the things that happened was because both sissies and young toms were modeling themselves off of Korean flower boy masculinity, 
they end up looking the same, right? So this is kind of the ultra of the top, and this one, the person at the top is the top, kind of a new image. And, you know, this is obviously, this is a, a cartoon from Thailand. You know, this is what Khan's used to be like. And that was the same image you saw in that other little chart that I showed you. And this is what Tom's look like now, which is basically like gay men, right? Because they're doing the Korean talk masculinity. And so in, in Bangkok, there is a neighborhood in Lot Prao where there are a lot of stores that specifically sell clothes for Tom. So it's like, like this one's called Tom Chi. Um, and they basically sell small size men's clothes. Um, and everything, they say it's Korean when it's not, <laughs> just because it's more desirable if it's Korean. Um, so like Adidas is Korean, but yeah. Um, and you know, these are some images from the, these like advertisements for these stores. And this is the most pop famous Tom singer in Thailand, um, who obviously looks like he is doing a flower boy, Korean flower boy look. And um, one of the things I think is interesting about it is Megan Sanat in her 2004 ethnography, Toms and Dees, said it was unimaginable for two Toms to be in a relationship together, right? Because a Tom is always with a D and that was kind of a quote unquote natural pairing. Um, and then later in 2012, she writes an article saying how Korean uh, pop has changed Tom gender norms. Right, so we have this new category of the Tom gay, which is a Tom that's in a relationship with another Tom. And because they're both masculine identified, they're gay. So they're called Tom gay. And they do for them as TG. And that's very different in Thailand from what a lesbian is, which is a femme with a femme. Right, so in this image, you have like a Tom gay couple, so it's short hair, long hair. And in this image, you have like a Tom gay couple, which is short hair, short hair. Okay. And this is, Korean masculinity as their style of masculinity. So one of the pieces I've written about is how this has created the possibility for new sexualities. Um, so this is very similar to the image that I showed you before, but now there's this like new bubble here with all these new categories for Tom Gay, Tom Gay King, Tom Gay King, Tom Gay Two Way, meaning versatile. Um, so these are all things that have happened in my mind because of the gender transformations uh, following the Korean wave in Thailand and how Koreans have adopted kind of idealized Korean popular culture gender norms. Um, so in the paper, I write about uh, the two terms I use are Riproy and Dula. <clears throat> so Dula is a compound word coming from Du and La and both of them mean to watch. So like do not means to watch a movie, right? Um, but do la when it's a compound means to nurture or to care for. So you do la with your children, you do la with, um, actually you lean your pets, right? You raise your pets a little bit. Um, you lean sex workers. So you, the term for sex workers is similar to the term for pets. Um, but there's this idea that uh, you take care of yourself and you cultivate yourself in different kinds of ways. And that this, there's no like right way to do it, but it has to be appropriate to your social standing and your position. And that's in a relative hierarchy of uh, people who are above and below you in different kinds of ways. <clears throat> so I use this term rip Roy, because that was a term that, term that people use with me all the time. <laughs> like they say, young my rip Roy, <laughs> like you're not ready yet. Like, uh, so, um, in the article, I talk about um, an instance when uh, one of my friends came over to my house because we we're going to go a party together. And I did not own a hair dryer in, in Thailand. So after I showered, my hair was wet. And I was like, let's go, I'm ready. And she was like, no, we can't leave the house yet. And I was like, why not? She's like, your hair's wet. And so my thought was, she thinks I'm going to get sick because Thais are afraid of their hair getting wet because they say you get sick if your head gets wet. Um, and I said, oh, do you, are you afraid that I'm gonna get sick? She said, no, you're not ready to go yet. You're not finished, young my Rip Roy, right? So it's this idea that you have to be complete before you can be publicly presentable. And you'll notice things in Thailand, for example, like women never do makeup in public. Like if you're on the New York subway, you see women with lipstick and you know they're plucking and they're doing all kinds of stuff, <laughs> you know, on the subway. at home. 
in private before you can be publicly visible to somebody else. Uh, so I'm using this term from, from that. And a related term is duty. Is Duty is to look good, but it's also kind of situationally appropriate to look situationally appropriate. So like if you're going to talk like today, you would dress a certain way versus if you're going to um, the beach or somewhere else, right? You have to look appropriate for the, the situation. <clears throat> and I'm relating this to the kind of broader concerns around face in Thailand. Um, so kind of how you produce a face that is respectable in public space and it's also situationally appropriate based on your, your status. <clears throat> oh, maybe there's one piece I do want to read. Tamar <laughs> uh, um, Luce, who I know is on the Zoom. Uh, so one of the concepts I develop in the book is the idea of what I call interracial optics, or the highlighting and occlusion of variously conceived interracial relationships. Um, during the colonial period, Tamar Luce notes that the vast majority of transnational relationships were not among Southeast Asian women and European men, but rather low-class male laborers from China and India. Our Western gaze continues to the largest number of foreigners in Thailand. While many Westerners believe it is Caucasians, they constitute a small fraction of foreign workers, expats, and tourists in Thailand. The largest population by far are low-wage laborers from the CLM countries, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, followed by Asian professionals from Japan, Korea, and Greater China. So this is part of ways that race plays out in, in Thai public space. <clears throat> so kind of beyond making face, there's the repairing of faces. So uh, a common expression in Thai is not face literally breaks, um, like you're, you're embarrassed or you're ashamed about something. Uh, and here I wanna um, link this kind of personal face break to a national face break. But Thailand is very conscious of how it looks to the world. Uh, so whenever there are certain kind of controversies there are these like national scandals around different kinds of things of how does this look to foreigners or how does this look to um, the world? And I think this is related to um, kind of Hertzfeld's idea of cultural intimacy, kind of those like secrets that you have about your country that you kind of know are true, but are considered embarrassing in um, a broader audience. Okay. <clears throat> so one of the cases that I talk about in the, in the article is um, Kay, who's uh, the best friend of one of my neighbors in, in Thailand, and he had all this kind of stuff done, including a chin shave, which makes you look more Korean. It's that kind of pointy K-pop face. Uh, it's also referred to as a Gangnam face. It's from Gangnam. Cosmetic surgery clinics are, are concentrated. And he did weekly glutathione injections. <clears throat> the most time to do them, do them monthly, uh, but he did them weekly. So like he literally went from like, medium color tie to light skin tie. Like he was lighter than I am. Um, and that's from these weekly injections that he found. So I do know that it works if you inject it. Uh, there's no evidence that it worked for ingestion. Um, and so the kind of, so this is a YouTube tutorial for Thai women on you know how to make yourself up. And so this is, um, what she looks like when she starts, and this is what she looks like when she ends. And this is the model that she was trying to look like, which is a, a Korean um, drama star. Right. <clears throat> and during my field work, these were the kind of images that were considered desirable for gay men in Thailand. Um, so on the top is Ji Ho Lee, who's Korean. On the bottom is Jason Chu, who's Chinese Singaporean. On the right is Komasaki, who at that time was the most famous Japanese porn star. Gay Japanese porn star. Um, he died a few years back. Um, but Japan like dominates the porn scene in, in Thailand uh, because of the Japanese porn industry. And this is another image from another very popular magazine in Thailand, which is a Taiwanese magazine. It's like a male physique magazine. This is the cover with um, Rock Kim on it, who's 
ethnically Korean, but from China, mainland China. In 2015, when um, Harry got 300,000 followers, he's the most popular kind of uh, photographer for gay models in, in Thailand. So he's the one who like picks the person who's like the person you want to look like, right? And these are, that was the image that he posted for his, when he had 300,000 fans. I don't know what he's at now. Um, <clears throat> so this is an advertisement for a gay sauna in, in Bangkok that came out during my field work. Um, and this is kind of when I was starting to think about how Asia is figured in the kind of Thai imagination. And you, know, you can see the countries listed here. Um, obviously missing are the CLM countries, China, Lao, Myanmar, which are literally Thailand's neighbors, um, but don't, you know, are not on the map of Asia, so to speak. So they would often not be referred to as Asian people, right? So when people use Asian people, they're talking about Asian people from developed countries, which is how I came up with that Kun Kao and uh, Kun Asia combination as white Asian. <clears throat> Some of you probably know Nichikun. He's the first uh, Thai K-pop star. He was very popular at that time, as was uh, Barry Kuimia. They're like peers, basically. Um, and during my field work, there was a controversy because his last name is Japanese, obviously. Um, and it was discovered that his biological father is not Japanese, but actually um, so it was considered a devaluation of his status to have a Austrian, meaning from Austria and Europe, father instead of a Japanese father. But then he did this apology, public apology, and showed his dutiful sonness and respect for his father, which made him seem Japanese culturally, right? So there was kind of a way that it was repaired, and he's one of the promoters for Oishi, green tea, and such. So he plays Japanese. Um, this is also a popular model during my field work. Uh, he's actually Vietnamese. And so this is kind of one of the ways that I'm looking at this linkage to development um, is that Vietnam is, when I started my field work, Vietnam was considered a poor country, right? So like my partner's Vietnamese. And when um, we were in Bangkok, people would say things like, how can, how can you afford to be here? Like, oh, I've never met a Vietnamese person who's well-dressed before, you know, things like that. Um, and then this model came out and, uh, and by the time my field ended, there were like articles in the newspaper, like Vietnam is going to surpass Thailand in terms of, you know, GDP and blah, 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 which was kind of this huge sense of anxiety for Thai people because Malaysia and Singapore had done that previously. And they're always comparing themselves to their neighbors. He was voted the male model of the year in I think 2012 by M Thai, which is like a men's website. And then subsequently became a US citizen uh, or permanent resident, um, which showed kind of his trajectory, right? Because he then went to the US. Um, and this is an image of him at G Circuit, which is happening right now in Thailand. It's the largest this year in Phuket. Uh, it's always around Songkran. Um, and this is an image of him with uh, Peter Lay, who's the most famous kind of Asian American porn star right now. And Peter Lay is not gay, but he's the gay porn star. Um, but this is, so they, they kind of represent like what hot guys would look like to the people who go to these kinds of parties. Right? Um, and the way that I end the, the article is looking at kind of uh, the example of tattoos as one kind of form of um, status distinction. Uh, and so if you know Thai tattooing, you know what Sakyan looks like. Uh, it's kind of folk religious. Um, there's typically uh, certain godlike symbols like Hanuman or certain repeating motifs, uh, but you also get a lot of this text, which is usually Khmer text as opposed to Thai text. Um, but it's considered now in like Bangkok, it's considered very low class and like um, working class kind of aesthetics. Right? I think that, uh, like this guy has military fatigues on, you know. Um, that kind of type would do, which is not who, what, if you're a middle-class Thai gay man, it's not what you'd want to do yourself. Um, but you might find this person attractive because they're like rough trade as opposed to, you know, they're like a real man as opposed to like some other gay boy, right? Whereas this is like more like what the average 
Thai gay man would have, which is the kind of quote unquote tribal or Polynesian tattoo, similar to what you see in, in the US. Um, but if you want to be in right now, you have to have a Japanese tattoo, right? Uh, and this is an image of a, of a Thai influencer. He has a cable program where he goes to Japan to eat. All he does is go to restaurants and eats, and you just <laughs> see him eating. Um, and you can see, uh, this was his first tattoo. He's gotten more since. But you can see he's you know, showing off his Japanese tattoo, which has this kind of traditional Japanese imagery on it. Um, so uh, Honma has written about this in the US. Like, you know, there's, this is also kind of popular motif in the US. Um, but these are clearly not Japanese tattoos because Japanese people, for the most part, don't have tattoos, and it's still very highly stigmatized and associated with yakuza, the, the gang thing. Uh, so this is so the reason why I use this image: is here's this Thai guy with his Japanese tattoo and his Japanese boyfriend who has no tattoos, yeah. right? So it's again this kind of imagination of um, a desire for kind of a better Asian place than Thailand. <clears throat> so one of the questions that I have kind of for all of you, since you're experts too, in some kinds of ways. Um, so I'm Korean, and uh, there's the same kind of uh, attitude around body work in Korea as what I've talked about in, in Thailand. Uh, and there's like a huge literature on Korean cosmetics and cosmetic surgery and stuff now, because by some statistics, Korea has the highest rate of cosmetic surgery in the world. Um, which is a very new thing because in traditional Korean culture, uh, Confucian rules prohibit you from changing the body. So when my mother got her ears pierced, my father was very upset because uh, he would say, Pukdorjo, like you literally drain the luck out of your body by having a hole in your body. Right? Um, so in kind of traditional Korean culture, Confucian rules say to respect your parents, to respect your ancestors, you don't change the body. So that's completely completely changed now, where now like people talk about the <laughs> obligation to change your body because you need to do things like be successful in life. And, you know, Korea is one of those places where when you submit a resume, you have a picture <laughs> on it. So you have to look good on your resume. So you have to, there's like a requirement to present yourself in a, in a certain kind of way. Um, if you've ever gone to take a picture in Thailand for one of these photos, they automatically lighten your photo. I don't know if you've experienced this, but like, it's, it's like built into their like, digital camera, the photo comes out lighter than you are, literally. And, but there's no Korean word for this. There's no Thai word for this, kind of this kind of constant self-improvement. That's kind of what I'm looking at or looking for right now. Um, and the closest thing I can find to that in an Asian context is like Kaizen in Japan, continuous quality improvement. So like this idea that you're constantly making something better, right? There's no end like you constantly make it better, 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 better. And that's, you know, this is the, there were tons of American business books written about Kaizen because that's supposedly why like Toyota became better than, you know, Ford and Dodge and so on. Right. So that's kind of the question I have if people have input. Um, and so I'm gonna end with this conclusion that, um, you know, body modifications are, ex are used to express class distinction and place one appropriately within social and global hierarchies. Uh, the ideals to which contemporary middle-class ties aspire is highly key to Northeast Asian aesthetics, so particularly Korean Japan. Um, and embodied practices of style and transformation enhance social standing and demonstrate participation, this is for Thai people, in a cosmopolitan Asia, which is kind of where they want to be. So that's my talk. Thank you very much. And I think I made it right on time, yeah? Yeah, you did. Okay. Okay, so we're going to go into the Q&A portion, and uh, we will start with the last question. Uh, let's see, was it Tom? Or... Okay, okay, we should be done. <laughs> I guess I have a really quick question about um, the lack of diverse bara sexuality and those um, connections, bara sexuality, and those connections to like light skin and white like the traditionally hyper I'm getting it's coming through here too. Oh. Hyper masculinized like bar sexuality, which is also spreading out to Korea and Southeast mm -hmm. Asia, represents being a little away from this light light skin, or it's still entirely considered the same thing. So bara is light skin too, for the most okay. part. 
Uh, the difference is it can be hairy, oh, right? Um, and, um, and in certain Japanese contexts, the hairiness is considered bestial and like oh. undesirable because it's like more animal-like than human-like. And in a lot of you know, Asian contexts, there's a strong human animal distinction, including in, in Thailand. Um, so the hairiness is something that's a little different about bara masculinity and bara is Japanese. Um, where it plays out in some of my, I haven't written about it, but where it plays out in some of my work is for example, um, in gay male communities, like masculine identified gay men are interested in things like bara representations mm -hmm. and they actually hate representation, same in Japan. They actually hate the representation of feminine masculinity, uh, dut masculinity, and so they actively kind of denounce dut masculinity in part of kind of shoring up their own like better masculinity. Um, so you see that in the Thai context where, uh, so right now one of the big things is um, ding and sao wai. Sao wai means, you know, why, why girl. Uh, so these are like young women, mostly young women, who are into BL and yaoi. So the why comes from yaoi. Um, and this is huge in, in Thailand right now. And if you didn't know, Thailand produces more boys love dramas than any other country now. Um, and so the last time I checked was 2017. So GMM TV, which is the largest media company in Thailand, their prime time, um, night, prime time at night programming was already majority queer in 2017. And that was because that was the beginning of the explosion of boys love dramas in Thailand, which have now become huge in places like the Philippines um, and other parts of in China, et cetera, other parts of uh, Asia. So the like normatively masculine gay men hate the BL imagery. So the BL imagery, they're very young, they're very cute, and they're coded as kind of feminine, so kind of dude like um, which is in contrast to the like baramanga masculinity, which is very virile, like hyper masculine, like they have like the bodies of like gorillas kind of. Um, so I guess a Western equivalent would be like Tom in Finland, right? So it's that kind of a distinction. But, but like, it does not escape the hierarchy. And, you know, Japanese are very into whiteness. Right. So a lot of the terms actually come from Japanese. All right, thanks. Uh, so we've got another question. I'm just going to walk up to you sure. so that you can hear me over on the Zoom. Um, so this is from Dean Nguyen. Um, Hello again. Uh, so all these images gave me nostalgia because they resemble my childhood growing up in the early in early 2000s in Vietnam. My question, ooh, my goodness, I think I scrolled too far. My question would be, do you think there is some kind of cultural dominance within sub Asian region countries like Southeast Asian countries? Um, I think I just lost that. Uh, Okay, if so, would these changes, integration and global, globalization significantly affect any urban scapes of Thai youth with not only American or European cultures, but also sub-Asian cultures? Yes, thank you for the question. So um, actually the way that I talk about this kind of work is I refer to as inter-Asia. Um, so there's kind of a field now of quote unquote inter-Asia studies and inter-Asia cultural studies. Um, so looking at kind of the relationships between Asian cultures and how they're influencing each other. And right now, obviously, um, Korea is kind of the biggest influencer in, in this space. Um, it was actually at the Inter-Asia Cultural Studies Conference in Singapore, which was, I think, 2016, I think was when it was last in Singapore, when um, uh, Hua Ben Chat, who is a famous Singaporean sociologist, said, uh, Korean popular culture is Asian popular culture. Right? He was like, nobody's ever going to watch Singaporean dramas. <laughs> but he was like, uh, and, and this was because there was a student, a graduate student from mainland China who was saying, oh, we like to watch Thai boys love dramas now. And he was like, I don't care what you like. <laughs> <laughs> like Korean media is Asian media basically at, at that point. Um, I think he's wrong there, but... Uh, that was kind of his response. Um, so I think that you know there is this kind of way um, that these things are very regional in a particular way. Like you know now in America, everybody knows 
who BTS is and like post size Gangnam Style, everybody knows what K-pop is, but that's still relatively new. And um, I don't know how to like specialize taste like in, in US culture. Whereas in places like Thailand, like Korean dramas, Korean pop, like that's ubiquitous now. It's like, and I, you know, one of the things that I was looking at before was how Thai pop music has incorporated K-pop into like how it's visualized and um, uh, the kind of um, the dance routines that they use, et cetera. Uh, Thai pop music has become very kind of influenced by K-pop now, which I would not say that about American pop music, right? There's a different kind of relationship there. Uh, so that's, so I think there's definitely kind of this inter-Asia relationship that's really key to what's going on in Southeast Asia in particular, because uh, Southeast Asia in particular has kind of largest consumption of Korean wave media in the world, um, which is also true in Vietnam too. So Vietnam also has like a really big uh, following of Korean dramas and K-pop, things like that. Um, and I remember my first trip to Vietnam was in 1998 and there was an article in the newspaper, stop wanting to be Korean. This was in 1998. Like, Everybody wants Korean cosmetics. Everybody wants a Korean refrigerator. Everybody wants like these Korean things. Buy Vietnamese instead. And then I was like, you know, this was in the English newspaper in, in Vietnam. And I was reading this and I was like, Vietnam doesn't make cosmetics. Vietnam doesn't make refrigerators, right? Because this was in the 90s when um, Vietnam was just opening up to global trade. So. You, at that time, I was like kind of like snarky and like you can't even buy Vietnamese at this point because Vietnam doesn't produce these things, right? So like even if you travel in Southeast Asia, like if you go to Laos or Cambodia, um, like if you buy shampoo, the shampoo you're buying is Thai shampoo because they don't make their own. It's being imported from, from Thailand, which is kind of the regional manufacturing center for Southeast Asia. And so the Thai shampoo in Cambodia costs more than Thai shampoo in Thailand, even though Cambodia is a poorer country. Right, so there are these different kinds of dynamics that need to be happening. I'm a political scientist, so I'm really interested in your conclusions by friends of the point you made earlier on about how climate modification places tightness within a sort of global and a regional hierarchy. Mm -hmm. I'm also the parent of a nine year old girl mm -hmm. who. Um, uh, in ways that I am not, I'm just not used to because I didn't grow up in a different, in, when this was current, you know, completely obsessed with Corbynese culture. Mm -hmm. Since you can see Corbynese culture in many different ways, and body modification is very clearly for her. Mm -hmm. um, it raises the question about conceptual separability of Western ideas of whiteness and Northeast Asian ideas of whiteness. Right. Because the distinctive feature of Corbynese conceptions of whiteness is that they are not purely indigenous people. Mm -hmm. and this is not just a body modification cultural thing. This goes back to Korea incorporated mm -hmm. into, you know, uh, especially with the Yonkers and the Prussians, and you know, you, you know this as well as I do. So how do how can we place, you know, also given Thailand's own history, how do we place the, the idea of looking to what these aesthetic ideals as like a particularly inter-Asian phenomenon rather than a truly cosmopolitan phenomenon? Which I think regrettably does implicate the West, even yeah. as I'm tired of saying that. Right, right. So I, I think there it's a matter of degree, right? So like um, I was having a conversation with one of my nephews who just graduated from high school, but the conversation was a couple years ago. And he was like, you know, when I, so he's really into uh, manga. And he's like, when I read these Japanese mangas, so many of them are gay, right? And I was like, actually, they're not gay their boys love, and I was trying to explain to him this versus what gay is, and um, you know, he's in high school, and he got it, but it took me a while to, to, to get there. Um, so for sure among young people, like, um, Corpanese media is big, right? And like, there are all the little K-pop fans and stuff out there. Um, but for me, it's still not mainstream in America. It's still kind of niche. Whereas in a place like Thailand, like during my field work, uh, when I first started, I like literally counted the 
the music video, there used to be three screens between Paragon and Siam Square. I don't know if you remember this, um, that were like in the middle in the plaza and they play music videos on those screens. So when I first started, I literally counted the, the videos and looked, see how many were Korean. And at that point, a third of them were Korean. And if you actually walk into Siam Square, that mall, like all the music they play in the mall is K-pop. Right, that's all they play. Um, so by that time, it, it had already become ubiquitous. That was in 2009. Uh, but that's not true in a place like the US. Like if you go to the mall in the US, well, you're gonna hear Muzak anyway, because they don't wanna, well, Thailand is not paying <laughs> any of these royalties either, but in and stuff like that. But, um, but it would still be weird to go somewhere and hear K-pop, as opposed to like, if you went to a restaurant, unless you're going to like a sushi restaurant, I would think, or a Korean restaurant, it'd be weird to hear K-pop in a restaurant. Whereas if you go to a, a Thai restaurant, that's like normal. So I think the kind of degree is really different in terms of um, acceptance and uh, consumption of the Corpanese media. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we got a question. Here, so I uh, how does ethnicity, class, vocation, and other markers of social difference in Thailand differentially structure the mimetic appeal of Corpanese and white Asian ideals, which is to say what social groups are and are not um, refashioning their lives according to these ideals. Right, so my work is focusing on middle-class ties. Um, and like in the book, I have a chapter that's just on race and ethnicity in Thailand. So depending on how you count it, so the Thai government officially has five racial groups. Um, you know, anthropologists like will say there's 70 or 80 racial ethnic groups in Thailand. So, you know, the count varies dramatically depending on how you do the count. Um, and obviously one of the counts for the government is like they count Thai Muslims as different than Thai Buddhists, but obviously they're Thai. Um, uh, and in Thailand, there is this kind of multi-ethnic sphere that's recognized in certain ways and completely erased in other ways. So Thai-ness means that you're Thai, which is different than, you know, Siam, which was theoretically kind of a multi-ethnic space. Um, and the kind of thing that both Thais and foreigners think about when they think about ethnicity in Thailand is the hill tribes, right? The um, Chao Khao, Khao here meaning mountain instead of white. Um, so those are the kind of people that are referred to. And like now there's a lot of, like if you watch Thai animation, they have characters now that are like hill tribe characters. Um, and there's kind of this, like in kind of more artsy scenes, like now it's popular to buy like Hmong textiles and like make skirts and stuff out of them. These kind of like ethnic looking clothes, um, which is kind of relatively new. Uh, so I think that there are ways that kind of ethnicity and ways people are thinking about ethnicity is changing. And in a lot of the Thai cartoons, like the hill tribes are always like the environmentalists or the people who take care of the earth, um, as opposed to like, you know, people who are destroying the earth and stuff like that. So there's a way that they're romanticized, uh, but they're still generally considered inferior. Um, so the word that I would hear Thai people use a lot for hill tribes and other groups is uncivilized. And when I ask something like, what does it mean for you know, a group to be uncivilized? Well, they don't even have their own country, right? Like, you know, there's Chinese people, there are Korean people, there are Japanese people, but like Hmong, they don't have a country, right? They're uncivilized. They, they, they've never reached that kind of pinnacle. Whereas like a country like Cambodia, they were civilized, but now they're like, you know, doi patana, they're like lowly now. Um, but they had great moments in the past, obviously in a, you know, in, in like Thai architecture and religious history, obviously the early period is the, the Khmer period. Um, but generally there's this disdain for um, other ethnic groups in Thailand. Uh, and it plays out, so when I was talking about, for example, the map of Asia and how uh, Cambodia, Lao and Myanmar don't show up on that, hill tribes and other kind of groups don't show up in that. Um, because they're not part of civilization, they're not part of the, the world that's important, so to speak. Um, so they would be thought of as less than, even though Thai people will often say things like, 
Hmong have fairer skin than we do, right? Or um, Burmese people have fairer skin than we do. Maybe it's because they use tanaka, right? The, the yellow powder. Um, so it's not just fair light skin. That's not the only, and that's kind of why I did the white Asia, right? It's not just the fairness and the lightness of the skin, but it's also this kind of civilizational status that kind of come together to produce this kind of idealized white Asia. Yeah, which is the second book, <laughs> right? And actually the, the way that I ended my dissertation, which is not gonna be in this first book, but I'm gonna work on that later. Um, so the way that I ended up my dissertation was, 
because my dissertation focused more on the interracial relationships. So the way that I ended my dissertation was kind of looking at uh, egalitarianism in relationships. Um, so kind of you saying like, you know, it's harder to look European than it is to look Korean. Um, so one of the things that the Thai men would say is that um, if I'm in a relationship with a Caucasian, I can never be their equal. But if I'm in a relationship with another Asian, people think that we're the same. So they'll treat us like the same. Whereas like if I go to a restaurant with a Caucasian guy and, you know, like I tell, like um, I was during my field work, um, a friend of mine who's Lao was in Thailand and uh, he had an ex-boyfriend who was white who was coming to visit him. Um, they were going to go to a, a restaurant and stuff. And I said, um, when you go to the restaurant, when the bill comes, they're going to put it in front of the white guy, right? Because they're going to think that you're a sex worker and you're not going to be paying for this meal, right? And that's just going to be the assumption, right? And you just need to learn to deal with these kinds of things, right? It's, that's how, that's like the kind of social expectation in, in that kind of scenario. And he was like, no, they're not going to do that. You know, I don't look like a sex worker. And I was like, actually, you do. <laughs> Because he was like skinny, he had like spiky hair, and he wore like tank tops and like lots of jewelry and stuff. And I was like, for a Thai person, you look like a sex worker. You know, you might look really cool and hip in Berkeley, but for a, a Thai person, you look like a sex worker. Um, and the, he had the dinner, and sure enough, he said he was, he got the next time I saw him, he was like super angry. He was like, how dare they like, you know, put the check in front of him and stuff like that. And, See, and, and this is one of those things that is a little different um, with, with gender. So if you're a Thai woman or a Thai man and you're with a Caucasian man, whether you're male or female, you're often assumed to be the sex worker, right? Because in Thailand, same sex sex work is very common, right? So that's, you know, gonna be the assumption um, if you're together as a pair, right? If you're in a group, that assumption goes away. Um, but especially if there's an age difference, that's gonna be the assumption, right? So I've had like Thai women tell me who have like white husbands, you know, when I go to the hotel, they ask me for my ID or, you know, when I go to the hotel, they say you can't enter because they assume that the wife is a sex worker. And it, you know, at any time in Thailand, you'll often see signs in Thailand that say no ties or like, you know, um, Thai people have to check in at the front desk or you know, you'll see different signs that point to that at hotels because it's very common for people to take sex workers back to their hotel and then the hotel management doesn't want stuff like that. Um, so there's one of the things that I write about with the interracial optics is that for a same-sex male couple if you have a Caucasian partner the Thai person immediately um, is outed in two ways. They're outed as being gay and they're outed as being a sex worker even if they're not. The assumption is that because you're with a Caucasian man one-on-one, -on -one, that you are a male sex worker for that Caucasian man. The way that I ended my dissertation was around this kind of idea of egalitarianness in relationships um, and what kind of middle-class ideas around egalitarianness in relationships was. So it's more like we're from the same background, you know, we're both professional and stuff like that, which is different than a kind of hierarchy-based relationship where you have a patron and a um, client relationship or like someone who's older and younger, which are also quite common in, in gay relationships, right? Uh, so the kind of interracial interraciality of those relationships out that Thai person is both gay and a sex worker, even if they're not either, right? So there's kind of a way that that's assumed in that kind of presentation. Um, with the male beauty, so uh, that asterisk in materializing Thailand, which is a book about beauty in Thailand. Uh, she talks a little bit about male beauty there. And I think that came out in the 90s. Um, and she talks about beauty contests and, and stuff like that. Uh, but I think that's a relatively recent phenomenon too in Thailand. And for the most part, like all the straight men that I talked to, they really could care less about their own like beauty for the most part, right? They generally weren't into like cosmetics or things like that which is different than like in Korea. A lot of straight men are really into beauty products and stuff like that. Um, but they would say things like, but I really want a, a Korean girlfriend. <laughs> I don't want to look like a, you know, 
介绍我也能，我也能，我也能看到。You know, outside of Thailand, and、um, what, like,、uh, Claire was asking about. You know, maybe you could talk a little bit about why China is left out of the Corpanese grouping, as the, like for aesthetics and development.、Um, so, I'll specifically kind of go to the end real quick.、Um, so, as I started the talk, there's this strong differentiation between. What I refer to as mainland Chinese and what I refer to as the tropical Chinese.、Um, so in my work, like、um, at the beginning of my work, like Singaporean Chinese were really popular, and they kind of like fell over time、um, in comparison to like、uh, Koreans and Japanese.、Um, but at the beginning, like Chinese Singaporeans were very popular. Hong Kong Hong Kongers were very popular.、Um, but there's Always been this disdain for mainlanders, and I feel like it's increasing, not decreasing,、um, because so many of them are coming to Thailand as tourists.、Uh, and when they do come to, like, a lot of my friends work for King Power, which is the big duty-free、um, Thai company, right? So any airport you go to, there's a King Power, and there are King Powers that are in malls and stuff like that.、Um, and you know, so I saw their training manual. <laughs> For King Power, and so、um, and the training manual has changed over time.、Um, so the the countries of the people that they talk about and the languages that are, because they have like how to say hello and you know how to say thank you in these different languages.、Um, so like the last manual I saw it was、um, Korean, Chinese, Japanese, Russian, right? Were the kind of foreign languages besides English, right? So there are five foreign languages.、Um, And then they're they're like the stereotypes of yeah, what do Koreans want to buy? <laughs> what do you know Chinese want to buy? What do、um, different people want to buy? And the kind of attitude that the workers had were like, you know, like this Chinese guy wanted to see this watch that cost a thousand dollars, and I was like, how could you, like he doesn't even brush his teeth? His breath smelled so bad, and he he looked like a peasant.、Um, and then he pulled out a wad of cash and paid for it. Right, so there's the recognition that they have money and they're coming as tourists and stuff like that, but there's still this kind of they're still low class in in from a Thai perspective, the the mainland Chinese compared to、um, people like Chinese from Singapore and, and Hong Kong and places like that.、Um, and if you look at any of the Thai tourist media,、uh, there's a lot of negative representation of mainland Chinese tourists who are now the majority of tourists in in Thailand. Um, so they're always dis disrespecting our religion, right? So there's like the stories of like the the guy who kicked the bell with his foot. You know, you don't touch anything religious with your foot in in Thailand. That's completely disrespectful.、Um, there were those、uh, images of like the Chinese tourists who were like doing their laundry in the airport and like hanging their underwear on the on the seats, right? Like so low class, right? Things like that always in there.、Um, There was a video clip that I watched of、uh, a Sino-Thai、um, actress who was at the Seoul airport.、And、so she's like, you know, recording herself like this on her phone, and she's like, "Look at all these Chinese people around me." She's like, "I'm Chinese too, but meaning Sino-Thai, but these Chinese people from the mainland they have no manners because I was here in line." Getting my refund for my duty-free cosmetics, right? At which, if you've ever been to the Seoul airport, <laughs> there's that big long line. It's just like I was in line, and then all these Chinese people came, and they don't they don't queue up, right? They just rush to the front, right? And this is not surrounded by all these Chinese people, right? So clearly, like this, that's the kind of image that gets portrayed.、Um, there was one image, that I, like one video, I found really funny. <laughs> so,、um, a lot of the tourists,、uh, like if you go on a tour, they have buffets for you at different stops. So there was this video of、uh, 
mainly of Chinese tourists at a lunch buffet during their tour. And the main item was um, shrimp. And shrimp are quite large in, in Thailand, right? And there was a woman, so the video was this woman who goes to the, I don't know what you call it, the thing that has the food in it. She takes a plate, she takes another plate, the other plate as a scoop, piles a layer of shrimp on the plate, takes another plate, puts it on top of that, takes that first plate, scoops another layer, and she stacks up five layers of shrimp and then takes it back to her table. Right, so there are all these like images that are always like, you know, Chinese people have no manners. And like I said, like I started the, um, the talk with, this is like a very common attitude. Um, I think it will change as China becomes more developed because like I said, the kind of attitude towards the Vietnamese is changing very quickly, right? They're no longer the, the peasants anymore. Now they're coming. Um, before in Bangkok, you could not exchange dong, Vietnamese money. You had to, if you were Vietnamese, you had to come with US dollars and exchange that to baht. But now you can go to many places and pay in dong and you can, um, all the money changers will accept dong as well, right? So those, those things have completely changed kind of some of the scene for, for Vietnamese, which is different than, um, I think the Chinese are still going to take a while to catch up, catch up, so to speak. Uh, but there's this clear differentiation between mainland Chinese and Chinese from other places. I know there were two other questions. So I don't know if you have to leave, but I'm, I'm happy to stay longer and answer. Okay. Yeah, um, we can also forward questions in the chat um, as well. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but thank you for having a round of applause for Professor Kim. Thank you so much for such an exciting and very visual talk, Professor. Um, there's so many questions I'm sure both audiences in person and also have. Um, so please reach out personally to um, Professor or us to get connected. Um, and also please join us next week on Thursday, April 21st, when I am almost six zero will present on her talk titled Environmental Change and Cambodia's Applied Food Systems, but I'm going to keep the characters both staying on.